Well, right on time. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Anthony Bloom, the Executive Director of the Mobiles for Education Alliance, and welcome to our next edition of our eCafe. Uh, we're really excited that we're joined by Dr. Scott Nicholson, a professor of meme design and development. Scott, I'm gonna give a little bio for you in just a moment. Um, I wanna welcome all those who are joining us today. Um, if folks have joined, if you'd like to uh, just add to your, your name or through chat, um, maybe your institution or simply just introduce yourself through chat, that'd be great. Just so we have some idea who's joining us today. I think we had around 50 or so folks RSVP for the event, and we'll just welcome them to our eCafe um, when they arrive. For those that have not previously attended an eCafe, this is a informal opportunity for us to speak with folks that were just really interested in the work that they're doing in ed tech, um, principally um, in, in the area of uh, ed tech for lower resource developing country contexts or applications that may have relevance. Uh, for those that, that aren't familiar with the Mobiles for Education Alliance, we've been around for around 11 years, um, but we established ourselves as an independent nonprofit last year and organized a variety of events focused on EdTech in lower resource context, including our upcoming symposium that will be taking place in September from September 27th to 30th. This will be our second virtual symposia. And we typically attract participants from around the world, Ministry of Education policymakers, researchers, uh, practitioners. And um, we will drop the link in the chat for the symposium. And if you're an individual that has a project that you'd like to present, the deadline for presentations is at the end of this week. And if you'd simply like to register to attend the event, uh, we welcome you. Um, and we'll talk about in a moment that uh, Scott will have uh, sessions at the symposium as well. So if you're intrigued by some of the things that he'll be talking about, uh, we look forward to welcoming Scott back um, during the symposium. For those who don't already subscribe to our e-news, it's a bi-weekly uh, e-news that goes out to our subscriber list that has updates of ed tech activities, uh, principally drawn from the 45 member institution of the M Education Alliance that represent most of the major development and donor agencies that are investing in ed tech in lower resource context. So we invite you to subscribe to our, our e-news and you can find out about other upcoming uh, e-cafes. Last thing is if you have questions for Scott, um, feel free to drop them in the chat as we go along. Um, Scott, I understand you'll be speaking for approximately 30 minutes, which is great. And then we'll just be taking questions from the audience. The e cafe is again, we feel an intimate way. Imagine that you're in a coffee shop. Scott's up there, he has a cup of tea, and he's just telling you about something really interesting he's working on. And, um, and then again, feel free to sort of use the chat to be able to ask questions. Um, all right, well, without further ado, what I'd like to do is formally introduce Scott. Scott is a professor of game design and development at Wilfred Laurier University in Brantford, Ontario. He's the director of the Brantford Game Network Game Lab. And he's written a variety of research papers and really a focus of study for a few decades on escape rooms, uh, meaningful gamification games in libraries, online education. Scott will elaborate a little bit on his background. He's also the author of two books, Everybody Plays at the Library, Creating Great Gaming Experiences for All Ages a designer of two board games, and his second book, uh, which just came out, and so Scott, we're really excited to hear about it um, with your co-author, Liz Cable, is Unlocking the Potential of Puzzle-Based Learning, Designing Escape Rooms, uh, and Games for the Classroom. What we're really excited is that Scott is on sabbatical this year from his university and has agreed to come on board as our Escape Games for Education Strategic Advisor for the M Education Alliance. Scott will talk about some of the work that he'll be doing for us and really look forward to our working with Scott over the course of the year so he could contribute his ideas about innovative ways to support quality education for the learners that we're targeting through the M Education Alliance. Scott, I'm gonna turn it over to you, welcome. Um, I, but the last thing I was gonna say, Scott, we had good fortune to meet each other just prior to our symposium last year, Play Every Day. And that was great opportunity for us to get to know each other and for you to be a supporter of the M Education Alliance. And I can't tell you how thrilled we are that we have this opportunity to engage with you over the next year in a more uh, technical 
in a more technical sense. So thanks, Scott, for joining us today and over to you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's exciting to be here today and thank you all for coming. I, I see a lot of familiar names in the chat. So those people that I worked with in the past uh, uh, and seen at conferences, thank you for joining me. We're going to be talking today a little bit about some of the common design mistakes I've seen in escape rooms or classrooms. And this is the first time I've given this, this talk. Um, a lot of times how I end up writing things is I start by giving a presentation, I get feedback from that presentation, and then use that to then develop out something into an article or into a book or things like that. So the concepts that I'm talking about today, I'll be, I'll be seeking feedback. And, and those of you that are experienced designers, I will say right now, so game design, it's an art. Making games is, and so you you can't necessarily say something is always wrong in art. You can have guidelines. And those of you that have designed games, I'll probably say some things that you will say, hey, I, I tried that and it worked out for me, or I have this other idea, or here's something you didn't mention. At the end of the, my talk, that's, that's what I want to do in the cafe, is I want to hear your feedback on these, these ideas, uh, mistakes that you have made, that you've learned from, uh, so that that article that I write can be richer. So that's my goal of presenting this in this more, more informal setting. Um, so for those of you that haven't worked with escape rooms, uh, this is the definition that I created back in 2015 when I started writing about escape rooms. Um, that they're live action, meaning you do them in the physical world or now in the virtual world, team-based games, which is what got me so excited about them because you work together as a team, where you discover clues, you find hidden stuff, you solve puzzles and you accomplish tasks. Because I talk about puzzles and tasks in escape rooms. Puzzles are things that are more mental, tasks are things that are more physical. In one or more rooms, so they may be physical rooms that you're engaging with or different virtual spaces, um, in order to accomplish a specific goal, um, usually escaping from the room, but surprisingly not, actually more and more escape rooms, even commercial escape rooms, aren't about escaping a room. They're about accomplishing some other kind of task in a limited amount of time. So that's, that's the definition that I created. Um, for the book that we wrote, we wanted to create a tool, a book that was focused on using these in the classroom. And so we came up with this term called escape games. And escape games are games that use design concepts from escape rooms. And so when I talk about escape games, I'm gonna talk about something more broadly than just escape rooms. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that today. Throughout this, I'm going to be using a stoplight system. Uh, so for those of you that don't know stoplights, the, uh, which I will interrupt right there with a little story that I, a uh, little uh, mistake I've made. And, and I'll talk about, a lot of this is gonna be peppered with anecdotes of when I've made games. So one of the things is I designed uh, with a team of my students, the challenges for the Red Bull Escape from World Championships in 2017, 2019. And we had one challenge that had red and green elements within within the challenge. So first, you have red green color blindness as an issue. Second, you have the cultural bias associated with red meaning stop and green meaning go because not everyone knows that. That was a mistake I made in making some game to be played at an international level. And that led to Red Bull funding two years of research at our school about um, a cultural bias in escape rooms. At the end of the talk today, I'm going to give you a link where you can find those articles and many other articles that I'll refer to throughout the discussion. But I'll be using this structure. So things that I mark with a red light are things you really should avoid. Things that I mark with a yellow light are things to be cautious of, and green light is how you should proceed, pr proceed ahead. And again, if you've done this a lot, you're, you might disagree with some of these things. This is really a guide for people that have never made an escape game for their classroom, and they just want some initial guidance as to pitfalls to avoid. So that's my goal here, is to help you be more successful the first time you try to use this technique. Escape, uh, problem number one, using a commercial escape room design structure for a large classroom. So teachers may have gone out, they've played an escape room, either a commercial escape room or like a museum escape room, a game that's designed for four to six players to be played in an hour. And they say, hey, that's really exciting. I'm gonna put that in my classroom. And so they bring this game structure that's a series of puzzles that's designed for four to six players and they turn a team of 30, i.e. the whole class loose on it. And it's a total bust. Um, what happens in that situation is that some people are doing the tasks, but most people are just watching. Students become demotivated. They become disinterested in what's going on. They become frustrated uh, because they can't even see what's happening. And this happens actually in commercial escape rooms too. Um, in the United States, 
there are more public escape rooms, meaning that you buy a ticket, but you can be put in that room with other people. So they will design a room and they'll have 12 people playing in that room together of different groups all working together. And what happens is if the room has not been designed for 12 people, then you end up having a few people doing things and a lot of people watching, and that's not a very good experience. And so part of the book is talking about different models that you could use in the classroom instead of the traditional commercial escape room design. So one way, and, and Breakout EDU, which is a toolkit where you have a box with locks on it, the idea of using Breakout EDU, the most common path, is that you have one copy of the game for each small group in your class. So you divide your class up into groups of four to six. You give each group the, uh, a, the, a copy, the same copy of the game, and they're all working on that together. And you could do that either with the breakout EDU and locks and kits, or you could do it with a puzzle hunt structure where you have papers, where people are solving puzzles on paper. Once they've solved a number of puzzles, they then bring that answer up to you as the teacher. You see if it's right, and then you give them another packet of paper. Um, so that's one way of resolving this. That's going to help it not be as bad. You could still have problems we'll talk about later with one person solving all the puzzles, but that's one solution. The, the challenge with that is that can get pretty expensive. Um, because by the time you've built all this out, and I've done this, I've run, I have a big game that I've run for 90 people. And for doing this 90 person game, you know, I had to have like 12 boxes, all with locks, all with nested boxes. I drive up with my pickup truck full of stuff and unload it. It, it can get unwieldy. So there's other methods you can use. Um, one method you can use is you can have stations around the room and each station will have a specific challenge. Now those stations, will might be like a poster on the wall. It might be a small five minute escape game to play in. Um, we, I teach an escape room design class. And what we did in that class is we had paper puzzles at your tables and then you'd solve the puzzles to a point and then you'd get up with that information and go to one of the stations and engage with the activity at the station and then come back. So this allows you to have a lot less overhead than having a copy of a box for everyone, but rather little stations. Um, we did with that game, we had a five minute escape room. So the way it worked is when you went, your team got to the point of being able to work through the escape room, you would go, you may have to queue up behind other groups that are waiting to play that five minute game, but you would have that little five minute miniature escape room and then go back to your table. Most of the work was being done at your table. Another way of doing this is to divide your class up into big groups that are doing different activities. So maybe uh, a quarter of your class is playing an escape room. A quarter of your class is doing some kind of worksheets and activity. A quarter of your class is having a discussion and a quarter of your class is in the library. And then you rotate students through those sections. So then you're only making one version of that escape room um, and a smaller portion of your class are playing it. Another approach is a scavenger hunt style. Now there's a commercial game that does this in Syracuse, New York, if you're ever through there, it's a museum of intrigue. And what they've done is they've made a museum. And when you go to the museum and you wanna play a game, you pay and you get a book that is your starting point. And the book is gonna lead you to specific exhibits throughout the museum. Now other teams are in the museum too. At the same time, you're going just to, you can see, oh, I need to find this exhibit and then that's gonna be my challenge and that's gonna lead me to the next one to the next one. Um, that would be one route. Another route is the scavenger hunt where you have a list of, of 20 things that you can accomplish. And so you can do those things in any order and mixing up the order can help. So those are some possibilities. I'll be curious later on to hear your suggestions of ways to deal with that. Second problem, designing the game the night before the class. Even though your students are probably writing their papers the night before class, you should not design a game the night before class. Uh, designing puzzles is more challenging, I find, than designing these types of board games. And there's a couple of reasons why. And I could say of the hundreds of puzzles I've designed and the hundreds of puzzles that I've graded and worked with people, the number of times I have had a puzzle on its first attempt to be ready for deployment is zero. <laughs> I have never, never, ever had a puzzle I made or a puzzle. Now, maybe I'm just an awful puzzle designer. That's possible. Um, but I've never had a puzzle I've made or seen a puzzle that was made that on the first play test, I'm like, it's great. Um, one of the biggest challenges when you're making a puzzle is that you as the puzzle designer understand what is supposed to happen. You understand here's how the puzzle is supposed to be accomplished. And you have to separate yourself from that to the point of being someone that knows absolutely nothing about it. 
Now in board games, in board game design, because it's the other thing I've done a lot of, you can write a rule set. And the goal of the rule set is to take people from knowing nothing about the game through a process when they're then able to join you in the experience. But in escape room style puzzles, many times you're not gonna have a rule set for the players. Part of the challenge of the puzzle is figuring out what to do. And it's very difficult to go from knowing absolutely everything about the puzzle all the way back to putting yourself in that mindset of knowing nothing about the puzzle and having enough signposts and cues to move someone forward to being able to solve the puzzle. Another difficulty with this is you only get to play test with someone once because once someone has seen the puzzle, they're not gonna be brand new to it. So play testing is really important. Your puzzle, I, I'll tell you right now, the puzzle that you just made, it's too hard. All right, we're done. I, now I can think of the number of times I've seen a puzzle that was too easy. I can count those on one hand. The number of times a puzzle was too easy, but almost all the time your puzzle is too hard. It's too complicated. It's taking too many steps. It's too long. It's missing something. Many times you forget to put something in the instruction, something in the guide, um, or there's a shortcut that you didn't realize that someone can use to, when I say the term brute force, that is this concept of using a shortcut to solve a puzzle. It'd be like if you had a maze and the goal was start here and you needed to finish on this side of the maze and the player was actually moving something through it, but you had nothing that constrained the player from just picking up the thing and putting it on the finish, for example. <laughs> and that's where when you play test it, you might find a play tester who might say, oh, well, there, I'm done. Um, so <laughs> this is why playtesting really, really matters. So you don't design your game the night before class. Um, building out the props before testing the puzzles. Now I've seen people get very excited. They come up with a puzzle um, and then they build, they spend a lot of effort building something out and building this complicated thing. Uh, this I actually see in the escape room industry that people build out their game before they even had someone play test the puzzles. <laughs> Um, so you go through an iterative process. What we call that is the MVP, the minimum viable product, prototype. I put the wrong word there. So what you want to do there is you want to start with as little as possible to be able to test the puzzle. Now, it can be hard to say, well, it's going to end up being this thing. I have to build out this thing to test it at all. I'm like, well, think back. Can you make something that would let people test what's going on? And remember, your puzzle is too hard. It's too confusing. And there's ways to cheat it. So if you spend all this effort and all this money building something out, they, you may end up having to redo a lot of work. Um, so this, these are the stages that I will go through. Um, so I will start by making something out of paper. Try to make it, uh, at least get the concepts down, make it out of paper um, or playing cards or whatever small things that you see, I've got this world of board games behind me. All of those boxes contain bits and parts, making something out of bits and parts to just try things out. So our game lab at school where I teach, we've got lots of board games that the board game itself is gone and the box is gone, but we have all the bits and the cards and string and foam core and all of this so we can build stuff out. Foam core is a great tool. If you want to make something that can last a little bit longer, um, if you make something out of foam core and you're really happy with it, you can actually cover it completely with duct tape. And that gives you a pretty sturdy product. I've used that before. You can make stuff out of cardboard, um, but you can also go digital. We have made digital prototypes for games that were going to end up being physical build outs before. So we've used basic tools for that. Uh, Google Draw is a great tool for that. I'll show you that in a minute, how we've used that before. Um, if you, there's a tool called Game Maker, which can make really simple 2D games. We've used that to try out a puzzle before we actually build that puzzle out. Uh, you can use Minecraft. So especially if you've got students that are good at Minecraft, you can get them involved in making these prototypes for puzzles that will end up being made in a, in a different space. Um, then you move up and the next step is you can 3D print stuff. If you've never worked with 3D printers, I will say now, that I have access to a cheap 3D printer and an expensive 3D printer, and they both make me say lots of bad words. <laughs> 3D printing is so frustrating because you print and you print and you print and it fails and then you end up with a pile of spaghetti and you change the settings and then you print again and then you get something and then it, the power went out halfway through and it's all crashed. And then you go, we made for a museum, we made a game to teach 3D printing concepts and we wanted to make the whole game 3D printed. So it was a whole puzzle box that was 3D printed. The thing took like 18 hours to print one of the pieces and we did lots and lots of pieces and there was so many fails. 3D printing 
is frustrating. Um, I have found that laser cutting is a lot less frustrating. Um, so if you have access to uh, some funds to buy something to help you with prototyping, I would recommend looking at a laser cutter over a 3D printer. What laser cutters do is you draw out the, uh, the, the thing you want in a 2D program. You can just draw line, line art and then it cuts with a laser into wood. And then it can also do acrylic and things like that. Um, because most of our props don't require the 3D-ness of a 3D printing. We could do these things with stuff that's laser cutted and then you assemble it. So I would say if you have one to pick, I would point you to look at a laser cutter. I found my laser cutter to be easier to think about, a lot less frustrating, I'd point you there. And then if you really wanna get fancy with it, um, then you can have professionals make it into something really, really fancy. And I'll show you some of those steps. So this is, so I taught this, this year, I taught my analog or my, uh, my game design, uh, escape game design class, and we did virtual games. And what we found is these were puzzles that the students made using Google Drawings. Now what Google Drawings lets you do, and it's a pretty cool thing, is multiple people can control the same drawing at once. So we had this pipe puzzle, for example, in the top left corner. Now this is something you might say, I wanna physically build out this puzzle, but I wanna test it first. So you make all the pipes, you measure out the pipes, you have some sort of unit of measurement as you see here, you make the puzzle, you figure it out, you then let the players manipulate the digital pipes. Rather than have to worry about AI telling the players when something right. So what was going on here is they were trying to connect all four of the corners to turn on water flows. And what the, the students were doing, the GM was doing on the other side, watching the Google drawing being changed is when a connection was made, they went in and changed the color of the circle to blue to indicate to the player that that's now active. So it allows you to simulate AI, to test things out in a way that makes magic happen. Um, on the other side, what you have here is a measurement system this was a measuring puzzle. So the idea was to weigh things. Uh, they had to find what combination of these weights would, ma would match the heart. Now, again, that's a puzzle you could build out and you could make things that have different weights, a three pound weight, a six pound weight, et cetera, and then have a scale. But you could test it here again in Google Draw. And what happened, same idea is on the other side, another a GM had the Google Draw open and would manipulate the image as the players were manipulating it to give them that feedback, to simulate what it would be like if it was all built out. So Google Draw, because you can be on it at the same time, uh, is very powerful. This is the story of a, uh, of a buildup that we did for Red Bull. Um, so with them, that was, that was gonna be games that, had, that you wouldn't build for your classroom, but I thought it'd be interesting for you to see how this came to life. So um, we worked with a puzzle designer, Wei Wa Huang, uh, who designed for us this puzzle that was a series of sliding walls buried inside of each other and bars you would move up and down. And as you moved a bar up or down, it would slide some of the walls back and forth. So it was a series of four walls, all with different cutouts. So he designed this conceptually in paper. So you can see that sometimes those walls would hold up a, a, a lever and sometimes the walls would let a lever fall down. So we built it out of cardboard, which is what you can see on the top right first, built it out of cardboard, tested it with toothpicks to see, well, does this concept work? Does the puzzle work? Is it interesting? I then used a laser cutter to make a wood version, as you can see there and, and then at the bottom corner. And so this wood version sat in a frame. It had, again, dowels that you could move up and down. And that we then sent off to Red Bull who had it made out of acrylic and cool lighting. And that's what was used on the TV show. But that was the structure of you start as simple as possible and build up from there. Don't start with the full build. Now, one challenge here is that um, there's a lot of resources involved. And you may be looking at this and saying, How, I can't do any of this in my classroom, my gosh. And that brings me to talking a little bit about the project I'm doing with the M Education Alliance, one of them over this next uh, academic year. And I'm creating something, I'm calling it Escape If. And the idea of this is, is to create an escape room, escape game platform for low resource classrooms. Um, when I first presented at the M Education Alliance, the question was brought up, I, I was talking about puzzle hunts and using paper and using boxes and locks. And the comment came back and said, hey, Scott, you know, we support a lot of classrooms where you can't have paper that you use up like you would in a puzzle hunt. At the end of the puzzle hunt, we'd have massive recycling bins of, of paper. And it's like, well, what if you can't do that? 
And so the M Education Alliance has a program called Math Power, where they work with low resource classrooms, uh, and, and we're going to be working with teachers in Africa to start with. And the idea is to create a toolkit for making escape games that require only a chalkboard. Now, what I'm doing for this, this might sound a lot like, well, Scott, those of you that are, have, uh, are gray and grizzled like I am and have had a lot of experience in different sorts of games might say, well, isn't that just a role-playing game? Yes, it is. <laughs> What I'm doing is I'm taking concepts from Parsley games. I'm taking concepts from the if in Escape If stands for interactive fiction. So I'm taking concepts from interactive fiction. I'm taking concepts from Escape This Podcast, which is a podcast about audio escape games in order to create a, when I call it a platform, it's going to be a guide to allow people to create games and share them. So there's a standard for how you talk about your games and how you can use only a chalkboard and found objects to do an escape game. Um, so this is my project over the next academic year. Um, if you are interested in keeping up with this project, I've already made a Facebook group. It's called, if you just go to Facebook and search for Escape If, you will find a Facebook group. So if you're interested in, on that Facebook group, I'm going to be doing videos as I develop it, live documents as I'm writing this out. Um, my goal at the end is that it's going to be open source. It's going to be released for people to use. Um, and so the goal is an escape game toolkit that you can use with no resources. So you, well, other than a chalkboard, that's the idea. Um, but you, so you can have a script and run the game in a classroom of script. I'm also inspired somewhat. I don't know if you know, uh, reacting to the past. That's another inspiration for what's going on here. So I'm just pulling from all these other game modes, bringing in LARPing, role-playing, interactive fiction, podcasts to create a toolkit to help teachers use audio-based and verbal escape rooms in their classrooms. Um, the M Education Alliance is looking for other organizations, partners, and teachers. And I'd like to uh, let Anthony come in to speak for a minute on how, if you're out there and you're like, I'd like to get involved with the Alliance and this project, how could I do that? Well, thanks, uh, uh, Scott. And again, really appreciate the background and then the opportunity just to talk for a moment about our the uh, math power. So. Uh, Scott, exactly like you said, we the principal focus of the M Education Alliance are low resource context in developing countries, Africa, Asia, you name it. So typically we are looking for interventions that may have some technology, but that could be just a form of communication. For example, Scott, this video or other examples about methodologies that teachers could use in classrooms might be the form of teacher professional development. But in the actual classrooms themselves, there may be varying degrees of technology. And exactly like you said, Scott, under this initiative called Math Power, we have a variety of different interventions, including you know, a math game catalogs, in some cases using interactive voice response to send math game descriptions, and ambitions to train thousands of youth to be math game ambassadors, to basically be able to support uh, delivery, uh, facilitation of, let's say, math camps um, math, other math activities in a community, they may not have any access to technology, but the youth themselves are serving as math game ambassadors. So Scott, while I know that you're testing this premise for us for math, we're also really excited that the methodology can be used across a variety of curricular areas. We're just starting with math because we have this initiative called Math Power. So for those organizations or individuals that are interested in this work, our work, please uh, drop us a line. Uh, we'd love to have you as part of this community, basically, that are interested in helping support the work we're doing. If you're faculty members at universities and you're excited by this work, if you have interns or students that might be interested in supporting the work that we'll be doing with Scott over the coming year, please let us know. We could always uh, use interns. And then finally, as I mentioned, we'll have the symposium taking place at the end of September. There will be a good opportunity to meet a variety of organizations and individuals from around the world. And Scott, in whatever session you and or Liz may be in as well, that'll also be a place for us to reinforce the idea of community building to see if we can attract other innovative approaches to support uh, the love of learning, particularly in low resource uh, settings. So thank you, Scott. All right. So the next error that I see is uh, when a teacher uses the entire class time for the gameplay. They have a one hour class, so they make a one hour escape room. And this does not work. <laughs> um, there's a couple reasons why this, why this fails. Um, so first it fails because these games always take longer than you think they should. There are technical problems, there's missing content, there's people with issues. There's the fact that you've only tested it with a group of four students and now you're running it for six groups of four students and you didn't think about you having to run around and deal with all these students. 
Um, you never want to have the entire class time set aside for gameplay. My base suggestion is that your game, your game length should be no more than half of the class period. So if it's a one hour class period, your game length should be no more than 30 minutes. And there's a couple reasons for that. Um, first is extra time that you have um, has less focus than on the time limit. Because what I found is that if you create these games such that there is a tight time limit, uh, people will not discuss things. They will focus on solving the puzzles. If it's like, we got to just solve the puzzles, they'll solve the puzzles. I've been in a commercial escape room that had an ethical decision at the end. Uh, this ethical decision was, should we abolish all records of banking everywhere and just start over from scratch? Now, we were in an escape room and they're like, you have one hour to finish your escape room. Um, so we got to, I was looking forward to saying, hey, this is gonna be cool. We're gonna have this ethical discussion about finances and records and what would happen. And everyone's like, nope, just do that. Oh, oh, oh okay. Um, so the, <laughs> um, if you have extra time, if you have more time, then there's time to have a discussion. I find in order to get people to talk about something in an escape game, you have to move the focus away from the time. So in the book that we wrote, we had a sample game. And in the sample game, there's a very clear point where it says, this is the end of the puzzles. Now you are discussing. And that helps people to realize, okay, there's nothing beyond this point. I'll talk about one way to do that for sure in a little bit. But the other piece that's really important to have in a class is reflection. Now, Dewey, a learning theorist, talks about that to learn stuff, you have to do stuff, and then you have to reflect upon it. If you don't have the reflection, then you're just doing doing, and you don't have the learning. And it's really important to have that opportunity to have that discussion. So my typical structure is a 30-minute game, 10 minutes of administration time, and then you have 20 minutes for a reflection time. Now, if you haven't run reflections before, I'll present one structure for that. So Tiagi, who is a rock star in the world of sort of corporate training, he's got his six stages of debriefing. And so the idea of debriefing a reflection is it helps the learners talk about their experiences with the game and moving from the, something being an internal experience to something being shared. And the reason why this is important is because each person has a different experience with the game. And if I don't get to hear anyone else's experience, I only get one experience. But if I'm with a big group and I hear seven or eight other people talk about how they experienced the game in different ways, I'm gonna learn a lot more. There'll be things that were in the game that I missed and only by talking about it, do I have those ahas? Do I have those things that are like, oh, I should have learned that. Especially when your games are designed to teach learning outcomes, the debriefing is essential to help people share and discuss what they noticed. So to do this, here's six stages you can take people through in debriefing. You always wanna start with emotions. How do you feel? You might be surprised to see that someone might have gotten upset by something in your game or someone was feeling angry about something to happen in the game. And you want to give people a chance to express that, to say, hey, this upset me or this didn't work. Or, I'm frustrated now. Um, when you're doing games for learning, you might actually create frustrating situations on purpose. And you want to give people a chance to say, hey, I was frustrated by that. And someone else is going to say, well, yeah, I was frustrated by it too, but then I realized that frustration was helping us realize this thing about how life is unfair in this situation, and that frustration was mapping that out. Um, then you want to let people talk about what happened. This is where these different perceptions are going to come out about, I perceive this, or I perceive that. You want to ask them, what did you learn? So this is where now you're going to take the what happened and connect it to the learning outcomes. And then the next step is, how do you relate it to the real world? So you've learned this stuff. How could you use it in the real world? And then you get your learners to think about, well, what if, what if things were different? What, how could we push this forward and, and what next? So with debriefing, you start internally, you move out to the perception of what happened, you move out to the connection of what you learned, you move out to the connection to the real world, and then the what next. Uh, what are you gonna tell people about? What could you create? Escape games are really cool as assignments. So you do one in class, and then you have the students create assignments to show how they can take things forward. Um, now we're gonna head into some yellow light things. So these are this, those were our red light things, there's some yellow light things. Uh, if your games have too many single player activities, or you're not accounting for the alpha players. So this was an issue uh, I was consulting with um, NASA on making some games that are now in science museums across the United States. And the problem that we were seeing in our playtesting is that you would have one child who would take control of the game and who would do each activity, not letting anyone else deal with it. And so we were trying to figure out how to deal with that. And what we did is we used, this is a concept that we'll use in game design. It's about roles and goals. 
Um, so what we did is we ended up assigning each member of the team a different role and we gave them a different tool. And during each of the challenges, one of the students had the tool that was important and got to lead the rest of the team in the challenge. So we built each challenge around each student being the, the leader at that point, the hero at that point. And that is a way to deal with the alpha player is to break up who can be an alpha player by giving people different roles, different ownership, different tools uh, to engage with the challenges. With too many single player activities, I, I like to use, there's, there's team building models to think about how teams come together and have challenges. And so what I think about is this structure of uh, forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning. And so what, what, what that means is I start with individual activities that then come together into big group activities that then move up to a harder big group activities that then dissipate into a discussion activity. That's the structure that I like to use when I put my games together. So I might have a few single, acti single player activities only at the beginning, but then the results of all those all form up into something. And from that point on, they're having to work together. Using traditional worksheets without a story. This is one of the frustrations I see in when I looked at breakout EDU games, many of those games that are shared online, they are games what I call worksheets with padlocks where it's a traditional class worksheet with a padlock to tell you if you got the worksheet right or wrong. Escape rooms and escape games have the ability to convey stories and narrative. And if you're going to use an escape game as a drill, it's not the best platform for it. These are resource heavy, these are time heavy games, and you should use these games as the way they can be used to tell stories, to engage people, to engage learners in understanding the real world implications of what they're learning in class. If the content you're trying to teach does not have a real world application, it's probably not the best topic to explore with an escape game. Escape games are not the best game for everything that's in a class. There's two times I find them to be most useful, either before you do other types of activities to get people interested, or after you do other types of activities to help people see the implications and the applications of what they've learned. Those are the two times I've found that it's best. Um, like with museums, I like to use escape games before someone goes into the exhibit. So it gets them excited and interested to see what they're then gonna be able to learn. Same thing with classrooms. Escape games can be great as the opening day activity to get people to realize, oh, there's real world application of what we're gonna learn. And then you move into your worksheets and lectures and more traditional ways of teaching things. And then afterwards, you could have an escape game where they realize, oh, we learned that in theory. Oh, we've got to apply it right here. And those are the two times when escape games are going to have the greatest impact. You can also add a layer of fantasy that can be then connected to reality. So let's say you're doing a chemistry class. Now, you could do a game where you're having people do chemistry work in the game. And that would be fine. You could show the real world application of you know, co uh, corporate chemical engineering and things like that. But you can also take it a step into the playful. You could take it into an alchemy space where they're still using what they've been learning in chemistry, but then they're doing alchemy type challenges. You could do something where it was diffusing a bomb and to do diffuse the bomb, they had to use what they learned in chemistry to learn that diffusing a bomb. And this is where the reflection will then connect to say, okay, in the game, you were doing this alchemy stuff, but everything you did is actually being done in corporate chemical engineering in this way. We just called it something different for the game. And that connection is really important to make to have people make that aha. It can be really useful to start when you're thinking about how to make your game and your narrative interesting to start with a genre. The genre is really helpful in doing your design. So these are some of the more common escape room genres. At the end of the presentation, I'm gonna give a link to uh, my articles and there's an article where I, I did this survey from 2015 of escape room games. It's got this list in it, as well as a lot more about escape games. But what I do is I take a topic area and I say, all right, for that topic area, what might connect? So I'd say, okay, I wanna teach, um, algebra. And I'm going to teach equations with missing variables. Okay, what makes sense? Investigate a crime? No, that would be stupid. That doesn't make connect. Engage with the supernatural? I'm the ghost of YZ past. Probably not. Um, diffuse the explosive device? Maybe. There might be something interesting with that because you're solving for unknowns. Uh, be an adventure? Oh, God. All right. What we don't want to do is the Welcome to the tomb of the money, mummy. You will walk through the maze until you reach the wall that has the algebra equation that you solve on it. 
don't, don't, no, don't do that. Make something that makes sense. So you go through this list and say, what makes sense for a real world use of what I'm teaching or how can I add a story element to it and make your game around that. Finally, about using tangible or grade rewards or encouraging competition between teams. I see people use escape games and really there's like in the box, there's candy or they put a, a tangible reward in the game or they're trying to get people try to be the fastest and get through it. This can have serious consequences. And again, I've written an article about gamification in the classroom. And what I found is whenever you introduce rewards into something like this, rewards have implications. Now, when you give a reward something, you're saying, do that thing to get this wonderful reward. Play my escape game to get candy. Now, if I say that, I'm implying that my escape game is so bad, there's no intrinsic value in playing it. I have to get you to get my candy to play my game. And you can see how that's gonna put in the player's mindsets, oh, this must not be a very good game if they're having to get me to, to play it to get the candy. That's the difference between like contests and games. Contests typically don't have an activity that's, a, that's fun in its own right. They're getting you to do it so you can win the prize. Another problem is once you put candy in that box that's sealed up, there's an expectation that there's always gonna be candy in the box that's sealed up. That the brain chemistry that gets excited about getting those rewards then is going to get tired of only getting candy and it's going to want more to be excited. So instead, what I like to put in the box is an ethical discussion about real world implications. Yay. <laughs> but that is actually what I do. Many times you get the box unlocked, you get the things open and surprise, it's now your discussion topic about something ethical about what you just did or something to get you talking about. The nice thing about using that model is that helps you if, you, let's say you've got all the teams playing at once and teams finish at different times, they then head into that discussion at different times. Um, it also makes a very clear puzzle time is over, now time to talk. It also gets you ready to move into the reflection part of it. Um, if you have a focus on being the fastest, and I saw this in any time you have a competition, and we saw this with the Red Bull work that we did. When every time there's a reward or a competition, people will find shortcuts and cheats. They will do whatever it takes to get to the end, not engaging with the process. And if we're making a game for learning, if that's the goal, and through the process of playing the game is how you're going to learn, and you're saying, hey, just get to the end, you're then asking people to shortcut the process. So the more focus you have on time limits, on competition and on rewards, the harder it's gonna to be to actually have learners build an intrinsic interest in what you're doing. So that's why I like to have this emphasis on discussion and that time for discussion to move people into reflection. So that brings us to the summary of things to avoid. And this is gonna bring us to the discussion part of the, the cafe today. So these are the, the points that I came up with using a commercial room design for a large classroom. You need to design so that all of your learners have something to engage with. Um, don't design a night before the game the night before class because your puzzles are too hard and will fail. Um, building out your props before testing the puzzles. If you build stuff out and put effort into building it out, you might find your puzzle doesn't work. And that's a lot of effort that you've spent. Um, don't plan on using the whole class time for gameplay. You want to only use, I'd say, my, my rule of thumb is half the class time for gameplay. That leaves you time to fix problems and time to have reflection. Don't have a bunch of single player activities. You want to have a combination of things that are for one per person, things that require people to work together. Um, you can use roles and goals to help account for the alpha players. Don't just use a bunch of worksheets that don't have a story or don't have a narrative. If you're just gonna do worksheets, just do worksheets. Don't put all this effort into making a story-based game with real world connections. Um, use that either before or after your traditional learning. And don't build it around rewards. Don't use tangible great awards and don't encourage competition between teams because people will just focus on the win and the reward and not focus on the process. So what I want to do now is I'd like to open up the floor. Uh, what I would be curious to hear from people is if you have made games and there are mistakes that you ran into that I didn't talk about um, or other things because I'm going to write an article out of this. And so this is where if you've got feedback and things that I didn't mention that you'd like to share with others, this would be a great time to share those stories with others. Um, Tony, how do we normally do this? Do we have people uh, like raise a hand or how do we uh, handle? Sorry. Or you could type uh, in folks, the chat that you have a comment. To type make. in the chat if you have a question, folks, uh, raise your hand. Uh, again, this is our informal part of our e-cafe. So, you know, any aha moments that came to mind, folks, please let us know. And so you could turn your screen on and ask the question. You could drop it in the chat.
So there is a question about onboarding to the game. Um, that, that uh, Rachel built an online game and people had some problems with the technology. And this is an issue anytime, this is, this is one of the drivers for my Escape If project is I have seen the technology being a barrier to people getting engaged. Um, an example of that came from this summer, I had some students that made games in Minecraft. And when we were testing them out, we found that not unknowing how to manipulate yourself in Minecraft became a huge barrier to people engaging it. So what we ended up doing is we had the student, the designers in Minecraft sharing their screen and the players watching the student in Minecraft telling them what to do. And that would be one thing to think about is how could you make it so that someone that does know the technology is working with the technology and others are giving that person advice. That would be one way to deal with it. Um, the other question is, do you really need the tech? And that's where stepping away from making it easier is what you want to think about. And that's my goal of that Escape If project is to make something that's a script that an instructor reads and instructs them how to write things on the board. And there's no barriers to participating other than just talking about things. <coughs> um, so another question, what happens when your NPCs over invest in a game? <laughs> so this, and I will talk about the one of my big frustrations in the escape room industry when I got involved with the industry was seeing designers who saw the escape games as a competition between them and the players. And they were going to make the hard puzzles. They're going to make the hardest room in the whole world and you're not going to solve it. Um, and I could see teachers sometimes slip into this mindset to say, oh, you're going to, ha, 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 you're going to fail at all of my challenges. Um, so the thing to think about is that you are, as a, the person running the game, you're facilitating an experience for the players. It actually doesn't matter if they don't solve things right. If your goal is to get them to specific learning outcomes, you can do that in the debriefing. You can let them have that accomplishment and say, look, I got through this. And then in the de debriefing, you can pull that to the learning outcomes. Um, but the goal is to really, and I'll see like escape room companies that will say, you only get three clues in your escape room. And it's, it, it's like, no, you know, your goal is facilitating an experience for your players. That's what you are as an, at a facilitator. Um, you may happen to be playing a role. Um, so yeah, there's some discussion about non-player characters. There was a question about making students disguise as characters or detectives. There are a few ways that that works and a lot of ways that that fails. So I have found that asking people to role play does not work very well with many. Some love it and get into it. Many are just like, I don't wanna play a role, but giving them a tool that is puts them into that mindset works great. So it's like, you're the detective, here is your black light. <laughs> here is your black light that you can use to see hidden things. And so when you're shining it, it's like you're doing detective work. See how that now, that's that student now is that black light. And they're, when they're using it, they're acting like a detective. I'm not asking them to role play. I'm giving them a tool that they can use to get into the role. And I find that tool-based roles work way better than giving them a role that's uh, simply imaginary. Now you can also use information-based role play. So it may be that you are the uh, you're the wise researcher. And at certain points, you're gonna get an envelope that only you get to see, and you can share that information. Again, it's helping people get in their role because you're giving them extra abilities in the game uh, works really well as compared to you're the investig you're, you're the smart researcher, you say smart things. That doesn't work so well. <laughs> um, so there was a question about uh, this, how is this different than the scavenger hunt? It's not. These are, uh, that's, this model of escape game is just a broad term I'm using. So scavenger hunts could be a, a type of model that are going on. Uh, I, as I mentioned earlier, the escape F is really just taking from other game structures. So it's, and that's what I want teachers who are gonna use this to, to get their mind out of. It has to look like this commercial escape room box and it doesn't. It actually can take a lot of different forms that are going to have puzzles and, and challenges in order to convey things what's going on. Um, Rochelle talks about the ask why. So I have an article on the screen right now, actually a couple things I'll draw your attention to. One is we have arranged a, uh, on the book that we wrote, we've arranged a special discount code on our book uh, for the people who are here today. So if you're here and are watching this live, if you're watching a recording afterwards, this code is probably not gonna be any good, but 
for at least for the next couple of weeks. If you go to Corwin.com, that's the publisher, that will direct you to the, uh, the Sage storefront for your country. Um, you enter the code SUMMER21, that'll get you a 25% discount on the book. Um, and it's our intention at the symposium to have a book discussion time. So if you get the book between now and then and read it, we'll have some time to talk about what's going on in the book. Um, if you go to, at, on the, on the, if you want to keep up with the projects at, at S. Nicholson or Facebook, uh, but at the bottom link, the articles, this is where you're going to find a number of articles that I've referenced throughout the talk and one that's called Ask Why. Um, and Rochelle talks about that here. Ask Why is the, uh, the guide I have presented for escape room designers to think about their games, to ask why is something there? It, you don't just stick in a Sudoku because you want a Sudoku. You need to think about why is this here in the story? So, we, I, so when I talk about escape room design, and we really go into this in the book, how you design out a story, you create a series of story beats, then you use your puzzles to push the story beats forward and you create a world and a genre and you make sure the props and the environment fits within that world and genre. And then those props allow you to connect the puzzles to the story, to the players and the roles. But you make sure everything makes sense in the game. You don't wanna, don't use red herrings, please. Don't use red herrings and don't use black white writing unless it is something that makes sense in the world. But that's, those are sandboxes for other days. Does anyone else have a, a story they'd like to share about when they've used a game that uh, didn't work out so well or something that they struggled with? Yeah, Allison says, people create their own red herrings. And that's why you don't need to make red herrings um, because people will find red herrings. People will be like, hey, this book, it has a year in it. And I bet that year is gonna be the code on the four digit lock to open. Actually, here's a funny story. So funny story time. Um, <laughs> so I was running for my escape game class. I typically open up the class with an escape room on the first day. So in one class I did, the syllabus, I, I wasn't there. The challenge was I had a video popped up on the screen. Hey, you will have 60 minutes to find Scott, good luck. And the syllabus had puzzles they had to solve. So they're solving puzzles in the syllabus. It's leading them to things around the room. I also keep a lot of my props in my game lab. So all my breakout boxes. And because I, I'm an absent-minded professor, I always reset my word locks to the word Scott four letters S-C-O-T or five letters S-C-O-T-T. -T. I always reset it to that so I know what it's set on. Well, the students digging through the game lab for, because that's where class is held, find this box with all these locks on it. And they're like, oh, we found a box. It's got stuff in it. And they're trying to, they have, they have no idea what to use. That's no, it's not part of the game, but they find this prop and they start getting the locks open with the word Scott on every lock. <laughs> And they get the box open and inside the box are props from a different game that I used the box for that I hadn't cleaned out. And so now they're running around the room and I, I'm in my office in the next room with actual locks they have to solve to get to me. And I'm seeing they are now making their own game out of, it's got like kids jewelry, like tiaras, cause it was like finding the jewels. And so there was like tiaras and jewels and they're running around wearing tiaras. And then and I'm like, should I stop this? Because they're never gonna continue on with the gameplay if they think they've won, they think they found the treasure. So <laughs> anyway. There's a great Scott. Maybe there's a few more comments. Uh, it's really interesting, Charles. Question if you could see that Scott, if you wanted to reply to that. Let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. Terminology of game-based yeah, learning. Yeah, the, the game-based learning. Um, what I find in this case though, it, this pr the, the problem I found is if people use escape games to uh, do drill and kill type worksheets or something like, uh, like with math, um, if it's like, well, yeah, we're going to use the escape room. You have to solve my hundred math problems to get the lock open and get things open. You can do it, uh, but it's just adding extra layers uh, to activities you would normally do in the classroom. Um, so the learning is happening. It's building motivation and interest in what's going on, but there's more learning that's still going to come afterwards. So, but yeah, game-based interest building might, might be a good tool, a good term to use. That's really um, that game-based, oh, there's a term I hate. All right, sandbox time, soapbox time and sandbox. Game-based assessment, don't do it. Uh, game-based assessment. Um, 
is very makes me very grumpy um, because game based assessment is where you are. Um, you say, I'm going to use a game to assess people. The problem with game based assessment is games are a form of play. Play is by default optional. And so now you're saying it's optional assessment. You're going to be assessed on something that's playful. Games are designed to be spaces where it's okay to fail. Assessment is not designed to be a space where it's okay to fail. So game-based assessment, and especially, oh, I've heard this one at conferences, stealth game-based assessment, where you don't tell the players you're going to give them a grade. Whoa, that's awful. Um, so yeah, makes me makes me very, very, very grumpy. Scott, there was an interesting comment by Vivian reflecting on do not put re rewards in the final box. <laughs> yep, this is exactly the problem. If you put rewards in the box, if you put sweet, she put sweets in the box um, the first time, and then when you don't have it in subsequent games, it is crushing. And here's the reason why, psychologically, when you are doing something with a reward in mind, then your brain is replacing any intrinsic motivation to do the thing with an extrinsic motivation for the reward. So the intrinsic motivation goes away and is replaced by this extrinsic motivation. So what happens then is that players are going for that brain chemistry, that extrinsic motivation. They're finding no pleasure in the activity at all because you've crushed it out of them with these rewards. And we've done that for years and years and years with grades. And this is why kids before they go to school are excited to learn all about the world. And then we put grades on learning. We put extrinsic rewards on learning and we crush the intrinsic motivation to learn out of them. And that's why we have a lot of the problems that we have is we focus so much on these rewards, but that's a, that's a whole nother soapbox and story. If you wanna learn about that, I'll point you to Alfie Cohn's Punished by Rewards. That is the book that opened my eyes and really got me thinking about all the problems with rewards and using rewards in your games. <laughs> so Charles gave everyone a pocket constitution as the prize for breakout game. It's like my prize. You open the box to get a ethical quandary. You get to now have a discussion around. Yay. <laughs> so I think we're at the end of our time. Um, so I will thank you for joining. If you have other feedback or other ideas or stories that you'd like to email me, I'm going to be putting this together into an article that you'll find we'll end up putting out a white paper through the M Education Alliance space. Um, and so I'll invite you if you want to be involved with the Escape If project and that low resource platform, just search on Escape If on Facebook, you'll find the group there. Eventually, it'll live at escapeif.com. And I'll be developing it there. But I really want to develop it with the community in mind. So you'll get to see what's going on. I look forward to people's participation. Scott, I wanted to say thank you. This was a great audience, great questions as well. You and you led us through a really fascinating uh, discussion about your range of experiences with, uh, I love the, uh, the stoplights. I have to tell you, I love the reference to Tiagi. I dropped in the chat when I was uh, working for Peace Corps. We lived and breathed Tiagi's uh, interactive lectures for all these ways to keep um, trainees, especially Peace Corps volunteers for their three weeks of training like motivated and then activities uh, in, with, uh, with Peace Corps communities. Scott, we're so excited that you're, you're gonna be able to take and translate these experiences with the context where we work. And again, inviting those that are joining, if you'd like to find out more about the M Education Alliance, obviously Scott's provided uh, ways that you could follow the work that he's doing with uh, the state. Yeah. Um, Scott, I know that you'll be presenting during the uh, symposium. And again, just to put out there, if there are folks that are interested in general in the work that Scott's gonna be doing for us and faculty members or you have students that might be interested in joining us in our endeavors, please drop us a line and let us know. Nicole Scott or Scott Isbrand and Nicole, any other sort of announcements from our end? Uh, no announcements from our end. I think you covered it, Tony. Um, we just want to thank Scott Nicholson for a great presentation. And for any of you who are interested in the recording, please subscribe to our e-news and we'll let you know when it's uploaded. Terrific. All right, Scott, we're not going to make any challenges for people being able to escape this e-cafe, um, but uh, look forward to uh, to a number of folks joining us for this symposium as well. So again, round of applause or hands or whatever for congratulations. Uh, thank you, Scott. And uh, stay tuned folks for uh, upcoming eCafes. So wishing you a great day. Thanks. <laughs>